So we're pleased to welcome Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, a Harvard professor whose work has won her acclaim and made history. Her book, A Midwife's Tale, won the Pulitzer Prize for History in 1991 and became the basis for a PBS documentary. Her most recent book is Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History, which is going to speak to us about today. So thank you so much for joining us. I think this is probably the first time I've given a talk with a video. <laughs> so that will be uh, that will be a first one, and I, I'm assuming all the men are in the other sides, right? <laughs> in, in Cambridge, you only have women. <laughs> oh, there you are! There you are! Sorry, I'm so glad you're here. I do know that Google employs men because my son, Thatcher, is an engineer with Google, and he works in Manhattan. So I heard really wonderful things about Google and all the amenities, the free cereal, you know, <laughs> the other really great things that you have here. Um, and I also think it's kind of exciting for those of us who do useless things like write books to realize that people who are on the cutting edge of technology still like to read. And so I want to tell you about this book. It's an unusual book for me. I'm a historian. I focus on 17th and 18th century America. I've written a number of books about colonial and revolutionary America. Nora said I, one of the books that I wrote um, focused on a small frontier community in Maine, on the Kennebec River in um, central Maine, during the years just after the American <coughs> Revolution. And I do something that um, is often called micro-history. That is, I get really down and dirty with, literally, you know, the details of daily life in times past. So this book is different. So let me tell you how this book came about. This is a book that leaps through the centuries and is somewhat superficial in a way. It's a little bit like a Google Map, I guess. This is the planetary mode, not the street map. And I've, I've moved from, you know, from the micro to the macro in, in terms of trying to understand um, the themes that interest me a lot. Now, this came about in a very odd way, and we really have to blame the internet in a very large manner for the existence of this book. Because in 1976, I wrote an article. I was a graduate student at the University of New Hampshire in early American history, and I needed a topic for a seminar paper. And I wanted to write about women, um, but I needed to write about something in the early 1600s, and it was kind of hard to find women in the source material available to me. And so working around in the library, I stumbled on a bibliography that listed 169 funeral sermons. Funeral sermons for you know, pious Puritan women. So I wrote my article about funeral sermons, and it actually turned out to be quite, I got mean, very interested <coughs> in these sermons because they told me things I didn't know about early American women and about Puritan ministers and some of their ideas about what women could and could not be. And it turned out that it was much broader than I thought. So when I uh, finished my seminar paper, I sat down to write an article, and it became my first published article, which appeared in American <coughs> Quarterly in 1976. And in the introduction to that article, I said something like this. Um, uh, let me see if I've got my my place, my marking, marking place. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm 
gets paraphrased because for some reason I can't find it. Um, I said they never uh, went to college, they didn't go to Harvard, they never sat in the magistrate's bench. They were, you know, went to church even when it snowed. They were well-behaved women, and well-behaved women seldom make history. That was the introduction. And so I was making an argument that we ought to pay attention to these invisible, well-behaved women, um, and not just write about witches, <laughs> which is what people were writing about who were doing colonial history. So the article was published. A few people read it sat in the library for almost 20 years. And along came a journalist named Kay Mills, who um, was writing a popular book about women in history. And she called it From Pocahontas to Power Suits. And she really did her homework, which is not always true of some people who write popular books. She read a lot of scholarship. And she came across my little article and she had this great journalist eye for a good phrase. And so she picked up the sentence, well-behaved women seldom make history, and used it for the epigraph for her book and gave me credit for it, put my name on it. Well, it was a matter of months before that quotation was in a book of quotations by women. <laughs> and then I got an email from a young woman who was living in Portland, Oregon. And she said, I'm starting a company selling feminist t-shirts, and could I have permission to use your words? <laughs> and somehow, in the process, the slogan had got changed slightly. <coughs> so it said, well-behaved women rarely make history. I had originally written, well-behaved women seldom make history. It didn't matter. It meant, meant the same thing. So I thought, oh, this is just really funny. And I wrote back and said, sure, send me a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was astonishing. <clears throat> As I say in the introduction to the book, her success inspired imitators, only a few of whom bothered to ask permission. My runaway sentence now keeps company with anarchists, hedonists, would-be witches, political activists of many descriptions, and quite a few well-behaved women. <laughs> it has been featured in Cosmo Girl, the Christian Science Monitor, and Creative Keepsake Scrapbooking Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> According to news reports, it was a favorite of the pioneering commuter scientist, computer scientist, Anita Borg. The sweet potato queens of Jackson, Mississippi, have adopted it as an official maxim, <laughs> selling their pink and green t-shirt alongside another that reads, never wear panties to a party. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> here is this very well-behaved scholar, you know, and suddenly I'm famous for a t-shirt and a bumper sticker. And I started getting fan mail. And I've had lots of fan mail. And after a while, I just said, you know, this is just too crazy. Um, I need to respond in some way. I mean, and my, my objective was not to say, hey, you got that quote all wrong. My objective was to say, you know, something's very interesting here. That um, women as wide apart as a you know, scrapbooker, a quilter, or, you know, a young, hot, sweet potato mama, or whoever, <laughs> you know, are finding something in this slogan. And some of us who had pioneered in the creation of women's history in the 70s had begun to think that we, uh, feminism was sort of dying out. And yet, I kept getting requests. Can I use your slogan on this? Can I use it for breast cancer awareness week? You know, can I use it for my women's studies? program? Can I use it um, for homeless shelters? Um, lots of kind of activists were asking to lose, lose the, use the slogan. 
And then people were putting it on commercial products, greeting cards. You know, people are always sending me magnets, um, Christmas tree ornaments. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really, really fascinating. And so I thought about it and said to myself, you know, that's a darn good title for a book. <laughs> And my publisher thought it was a darn good title for a book, and they said, okay, write it. And the only problem, of course, is I had to figure out what came after the title, <laughs> uh, which was hard. And what I did not want to do was to write one of these sort of popular books where it's just one little, uh, you know, biography after another of people we've already heard about and know about, or here's an outrageous woman. I mean, these things are, you know, produced for middle school ages, for all ages, you know, 100 most outrageous women in history. I didn't think I wanted to do that. What I wanted to focus on, aside from having a little bit of fun with the notion about what it meant to be a well-behaved woman, I really wanted to think about what it meant to make history. As one of my <coughs> colleagues says, how many bumper stickers do you know that actually mention history? I mean, we're not the most popular teachers in the curriculum usually. <laughs> history. You know? So what, what was it? There was something interesting going on there, the notion of wanting to have a spot in a continuum called history. History, not good. <laughs> no, that's fine. So anyway, here's what I decided to do. I decided to see if I could write a book about all of the women in the world in every historical period, in every part of the world, in under 200 pages. <laughs> And what that meant was, I had to pick some themes. Some themes that mattered to me and that might matter to another generation of readers, male or female. So um, here's how I organized it. I asked myself who in the reading that I've done as a teacher of women's history, as a student of women's history, has really taken on the question of how women have made history. I mean, there's a bit of a problem here because women were way behind um, men in learning to read and write in Western society and I think in most societies. Far higher levels of literacy and if history requires sources, we're not going to get very many sources from women. The first book that I wrote, I had a few little fragments in a woman's handwriting. Mainly I had to learn from reading between the lines from other material. And, and you know, what is it that makes it hard to make history? Well, I, I came up with what, what I think are just three very, very simple points that people make history. This would be true for, for men as well as women, but in this case, I'm thinking about women. People make history when they do the unexpected. So we don't write history if, you know, the sun comes up in the morning. Not historical. If it doesn't, it is. So history tells us about the unexpected. So there has to be something pushing a little against the grain in order to make history something notable. But that's not even the most important thing. People make history when their actions produce records. No record, no history. So where are these records going to come from and how are we going to find people in history? But that may not even be the most important point. The third point was the one that really hit home with me as I began to do this research. And that is people make history when later generations care. 
And, you know, I don't know if you thought about that, but it's not like there's a great big barrel out there that's the past. And, uh, you know, we just go draw from that. History is a dialogue between present and past, always, which doesn't mean, um, I, I mean, really a dialogue. It doesn't mean we just can make it up. There's something there in the source material that resists our making it up. It's not fiction, but we bring something to it, and what we bring to it is our questions and our concerns. And if women are invisible in history, it's because for some reason that link between present and past has been broken. We can think about a lot of the reasons why that happens. That school <coughs> curriculum, for example, that assumes women didn't ever do anything until the day before yesterday. Or a sense that the things most women have done didn't really matter. Those kinds of things can get in the way. So, what I did is I began with three stories about three women in different countries and different historical periods who really were upset that women didn't have a history. And I was quite surprised as I looked at these stories to discover something they had in common. These women all had um, advantages over other women in that they had access to libraries. But those libraries cheated them. So here's the first one. This was in Paris, France, about 1400. That is before there were actually printed books. This was a library of manuscripts. Christine de Pizan sat in her study. She was tired of the work she was doing. So she reached up on the shelf and brought down a satire that somebody had mentioned to her, and she began to look at it, and then she got really upset. Even the side of the book made her wonder why so many learned men had devilish and wicked thoughts about women. And so she began to take more books down on the shelf, and the opinion spilled out like a gushing fountain, filling her with doubt. I could hardly find a book on morals where even before I had read it in its entirety, I did not find several chapters or certain selections attacking women, no matter who the author was. And she began to get really depressed, wondering if God had made a vile creature when he created woman. And so in her despair, she began to pray, asking, God, why couldn't I have been born a male? And as she sat with her head bowed, a light into the room and it was coming the wrong way it couldn't have been a beam of sunlight it was very very strange it came and it reached her shadowed corner and she looked up and there in vision were three radiant women terrified she made the sign of the cross and the first woman spoke dear daughter do not be afraid for we have not come here to harm or trouble you but to console you. And these three women who were Dame Reason, Dame Justice, Dame Prudence, said to her, we got a job for you, Christine. You're going to fix this problem that's troubling you. You're going to build a city of women, an allegorical city of women, a literary city of women, and you're going to fill it with all the great women in history. So, Christine, that's the introduction to her book, The City of Women, which is arguably the first women's history that we know about from the Western world, which was completed in manuscript um, under Christine's supervision in 1405. Okay, so um, she solved the problem, right? by creating her own uh, version of women's history. So along comes um, another woman. And this is uh, 400 years later, <coughs> in 1825, in upstate New York, 
Elizabeth Cady Stanton was in her father's law office, and he had a law library, bookshelves around his little law office, and he would bring students in to study the law. And she liked to hang out in her dad's law office, but she got really upset because there were women coming into the law office who would go out in tears. And she'd say to her dad, well, why can't you do something? You know, um, what's, the, what's the problem? And he said, well, I can't, it's the laws. See these law books here? The laws make the rules about who's gonna inherit the property and what they're going to be able to have. Um, and so Liz Kate Stanton was just a kid. She was still in elementary school. And she came up with a brilliant solution that is, she would go in when her dad wasn't there and she'd cut out the bad laws <laughs> in the book. But his law students found out her plan and they said to her, um, um, they told her dad, and her dad said to her, you know, Elizabeth, there are more books <laughs> where those come from. You can cut them out of my books, but there are more books. So you're going to have to just, when you grow up, you're going to have to go down to Albany and change the laws. So that's what she spent her life doing. And of course, when she did it, her dad was horrified. It wasn't a very ladylike thing to do. I think he hadn't thought she was really going to take him up on it. <laughs> so um, Christine brought women into history by gathering up stories from everywhere she could find them and compiling them and making a new argument with them. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote women into history by becoming a political activist, but she didn't leave her position in history to chance. She created a nine-volume history of the women's suffrage movement which became the foundation for what everybody else was going to believe. So she both acted in history and preserved documents that told about history. And that was a different way than what Christine did. Well, the third person I'll just summarize very quickly is probably someone, how many of you read Virginia Woolf in college? Room of one's own. So you know Virginia Woolf. Um, and you know she goes to the British Museum, and uh, she just wants to answer a simple question, why are women so poor? And she just goes nuts because one question leads to another question. She cannot answer it. She gets very upset at the guy sitting next to her who's just filling note cards because all the material is there for what he wants to do. She can't find the answers to her question. And what Virginia Woolf does is different from Christine, and it's different from Stan. She questions the very foundations of history. It's not just finding women who've done the things that men say matter. And it's not just acting in the world in the way <coughs> women have it done before. It's reconceptualizing what matters and what is of value in the world. And as you know, in her writing, Wolf was not a historian, although she really thought deeply about history. Wolf um, brought to light and made significant the minutia of everyday life. I love that model because that validates the kind of social history that has been so important to me in my own work. So these are three different uh, ways of uh, writing history. But you probably noticed that all three of these women were quite privileged. They're all white. They all are sort of part of the, you know, have fathers who gave them access <coughs> to libraries. Wolf's father was the editor of the massive uh, British um, National Biography, Encyclopedia of Biography. Um, they had access to a lot of resources that very few women in the world have. So what could we do with these three stories? So what I tried to do in the book was reconceptualize the stories 
the Pusan, Stanton, and Wolf told on the basis of what the generation of women who began to, to read, write women's history in the 1970s when I wrote that first little article about funeral sermons. There were hundreds of us out there trying to rewrite history. And so I took that scholarship and um, addressed in each chapter one of the problems for Christine de Passan, it was the problem of women and war. For Stanton, it was the problem of women and race. For Wolf, it was the problem of women and the ordinary, the common woman, and everyday life. And in each chapter, I try to say, here are some things we now know that we didn't know in 1970 about the worlds that Passan and Stanton and Wolf um, initially wrote about. And so I want to close with just one quick anecdote because it has to do with Google. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A little bit of an autumn whatever. <laughs> um, with Katie Stanton, in her um, autobiography, 80 Years and More, tells a story about <coughs> Um, as a young woman, a young unmarried woman, she's at her cousin's house, and her cousin is an anti-slavery activist named Jarrett Smith. And one day, he summons her and her sisters to the top of the house. He lives up in upstate New York, and says, I, I have a secret. I've got a promise not to tell. I've got something important to tell you. And takes them into this attic room, and there is a runaway slave, a woman that he calls Harriet. And he says, Harriet, I want you to tell these girls the story of your life so you will make them good abolitionists. So Stanton tells a story, and then in her own life story, she forgets Harriet. Um, she moves on to found the women's rights, women's suffrage movement, to do lots of other things in her life. Um, we know that she got interested in the women's rights movement out of the anti-slavery movement when she went to London for the World's Anti-Slavery Convention and women were not allowed to participate. But we don't know what happened to Harriet. And so my project was if I could retell that story from the viewpoint of the woman in the attic, the slave in the attic who had been overlooked. And it was um, not as hard as I thought it was going to be, thanks to Google. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I started at Widener Library, and I, you know, I worked through uh, print volumes, and I was able, through a biography of, of Garrett Smith, I was able to find out that the woman in the attic's name was Harriet Powell. Um, so that was pretty important I had a name, but that's all I had. So I Googled Harriet <laughs> Powell, expecting nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. And back came a website for a small historical society in upstate New York who had gotten involved in what was really an international project on the Underground Railway. Um, and in each town, people were trying to document slaves who had been rescued in their own town and find primary documents. And a link on this website took me to a um, newspaper article that, that just told sort of the story of Harriet Power, uh, Powell running away and then escaping over into Canada. Um, again, using Google, I was able to track down someone at that historical society and then email her and say, I'm doing this project, can you help me? And she comes back and says, you know, we have these old newspapers 
in our historical society that I think will tell you something about Harriet Powell. The anti-slavery newspaper, the Widener Library, one of the greatest university libraries in the world, does not have, but this little historical society had crumbling away these 19th century anti-slavery newspapers. And she said, would you like me to photocopy this material and send it to you? And she did. And I, there's, it, this is just amazing. A number of pieces in this article about this woman who escaped and ended up in Jared Smith's attic. And then later, she sends a letter back, and it's published in this little newspaper. And it told me that she ended up in um, London, Ontario, Canada. So what would you do at that point? I Google London, <laughs> Ontario, Canada, <laughs> and I find a public library. And then I email, and I connect with the librarian, and lo and behold, in London, Ontario, they're working on this underground railway project. And she's able to give me all the data from the U.S. Census, or from the Canadian Census about Harriet. So I find out that she married in Canada, she had a family, she died before the end of the Civil War, but she left descendants. The next project, which I didn't take, of course, would have been to find those descendants. But what, what this told me, this reinforced my third point. We know what we want to know, right? And somebody wanted to know about the slaves who had escaped the United States in the years before the Civil War. Local people wanted to know what their part was. Families wanted to know. <coughs> Librarians wanted to know. I wanted to know. And of course, thanks to the new technology, technological world, I mean, I could have sent lots of letters and so on, you know. The technique is basically the same, but it was really quick. It was just astounding. It was so wonderful. And the world, I mean, I'm very high on the internet, although I agree with my colleagues that the questions are the big deal. We need to know how to frame the questions and ask the questions. But today, you can find beautiful images of Christine de Pizan's Book of the City of Ladies thanks to an internet project at the University of Edinburgh and the British Museum are doing. You can read Elizabeth Cady Sands' papers online because of that. 30, 40 years ago, when I first became interested in women's history, none of that would have been possible. And so I think we have no excuse now for letting women disappear from the historical record. The only thing that matters, of course, is do we care? So I'll stop there and then hear what you care about. And we can discuss that. Yes. Well, I was actually um, walking down the street in Boston on Saturday, and this women's studies class stopped me because they were videotaping, and they just asked me if feminism was still necessary. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering what your take, how would you answer that question? What did you say? <laughs> uh, I said, of course, it's still necessary. I mean, look at the election, look at everything. It's, it's always necessary. I think it's probably even more so today than it was yeah. then. Yeah, I would say so. And uh, one of the things that I... <coughs> really try to emphasize in my own courses is feminism's plural. That is, what is feminism? There's so many ways to define that term. But do I believe that it's important for men and women to work at gender equality? Yes, indeed. And absolutely. I agree. I agree. It's very interesting in this room. Um, if you if you want to ask if feminism is necessary, it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I mean, I was joking about whether 
um, Google Boston only they employ mostly women and a couple of three great men. Um, but uh, it is interesting that still in our society, if something says women, um, it is perceived to be um, auxiliary. If something said um, history, even if it's entirely about men, it's perceived to be universal. And, and that's often a, a, a really serious, that's a, that's a hurdle, which doesn't make me want to stop writing about women. Um, but it's something to think about in our own lives, what we consider. I heard a wonderful program the other night on PBS about the healthcare crisis. That was the first program I've heard seen for a very long time. It focused on nurses, you know, who really do most of the health care. Um, and it was, it was fabulous and very interesting. And because I've written somewhat about history of nursing and history of medicine, I'm really very conscious of that, how when we see medicine, we see doctors, and there are a lot of women doctors now. But um, caregiving still, um, remains in our society um, an occupation often consigned to women and increasingly to immigrants. So, you know, there's a kind of hierarchy. And if we want to think about what is important work, you really um, need to go beneath the radar and not just take the, the commonplace assumption about what matters and, and, and what really <coughs> drives change in our society. Okay, what, anything else? <laughs> yes? How do you propose that we fix that issue of people who are not in a certain group, like uh -huh. don't care about issues in that group? And that's, you know, across like gender, race, socioeconomic status, like anyone who's not a member of that group doesn't care to be Yeah, I think, I think it's really, um, your question's great because it, it's not just about gender, <coughs> it's about ethnicity, race, religion, all the ways, it, and, and I, ironically, I guess, the way our new media is developing, it's so easy to only talk to people who agree with us or, or are like us. It's a huge problem. Um, I can, when, when you said, what do we do about it? Well, I think one of the things that uh, we have to do about it is start with ourselves and try to find ourselves reaching out. You know, I have a colleague who says our students now in our history program at Harvard want to do me studies. That is, whatever has to do with me, I, I want to study. And, and um, I, you know, I think that's a great place to start. In teaching, I always want to know, what do you care about? I think that's a really good place to start, but not a place to end. So trying to do more comparative studies and contextual studies. I'm, I'm teaching a course on the American Revolution now. And believe me, it's really hard to take a mainstream topic like the American Revolution and make sure that you're balancing in terms of um, gender and race. And I, in my experience, know that you start out doing it to be politically correct, okay? I've been through this in my life. I've got to have African Americans, I've got to have Indians, I've got to have women, and, and yes, I've got to have George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, I've got to have some founding fathers. You start out doing it to be politically correct, and if you do it seriously, suddenly you reconceptualize the whole story, and you realize it's central. It's not marginal. We can't talk about the American Revolution without talking about American Indians. It's just absolutely central to our story as we, as we get going, and, and I feel that way about women's history very much. So. I guess it's burdensome, but 
in our own, whatever our domain is, um, forcing ourselves to be inclusive is a start. And, and then you learn. Yes? So a lot of, or almost all of the women in this room work in AdWords, which is Google's only like external like, communication with the world. Yes. Um, and the majority of AdWords is women. So I was just wondering what you thought of that and what that says about Google and also how we should you know, act in that role. Oh, wow. Why don't you <coughs> tell me? Come through my say. You know, um, this is not easy. Um, it's not an easy answer. Number, the first thing is don't ever think that there's anything wrong with your interest in the field you're interested in, okay? It's not a better field or a lesser field because it's dominated by one sex or the other. But on the other hand, boy, we still do it. And I think probably high tech and science, I know this is true at Harvard, but you know what? History is that way. We have tried, really tried, to get a more balanced student population in history, and we still have um, a 60-40 male dominant. And it's really interesting. We have a lot of female faculty now, too. I don't know. It's hard to change. It's hard to change culture, and it's hard to change points of view, but I just kind of think, well, don't worry about it. As long as there's, as long as we're forging ahead, we'll, we'll try. We'll, we'll do our best, and I can't tell you what to do in, in this place. I, I just don't know. I, I'll have to confess. I'm a historian. My husband, who's here with me today, is an engineer. <laughs> we have three sons. What are our three sons? <laughs> Engineers. <laughs> One of them is an employee at Google. <laughs> so, so um, and we have two daughters. <laughs> well, my oldest daughter is a graphic designer. But, you know, she's very techy. And she went toward a more kind of arty tech. Um, my youngest daughter is uh, was a history major. I mean, what are we going to do about this? It's interesting. Maybe it's okay if the power relationships are not asymmetrical. And if people who are in the humanities have choices in life, and it's not so. People in technical fields have different choices. It's really true. Yes, you're going to help us with this. <laughs> so, so there are some inclinations that, that we have by gender. For example, <coughs> women tend to have better color sight. Uh -huh. At least the extreme cases, the genetic variation that, that some women have an extra range of color yes. men don't have, as I understand right. it. And, and that seems to be much broader. Women seem to understand color better, and that seems a good reason for graphic artists to yes. have a significant yes. gender bias. Yes, yes. But one of the problems is we tend to follow that inclination. You know, I've met four people from that country, they were all thieves, so anyone who comes from that country is a thief. thief. Is a exactly. thief, your standard bigotry. And I think we we make an effort to, to try to counter that, but you know, it's individuals making it. Individuals making choices. And and I think it's a way of thinking as well, and I've certainly noticed it in polling data. We've all been inundated with polling data. In, in this book, I confronted this question. It's really a question about biology and, and culture. It, our, our differences between the sexes culturally shaped or genetically or biologically shaped. And then we're having a, a huge resurgence now of social biology. Everything kind of goes back to our genes. And the thing that I found so helpful, I did this chapter on women in war, women warriors. And one of the things that I learned is that women have been on the front lines in every war anybody's ever known about. So, but men dominate. So the question is, why do men dominate? And there's some very, very, very interesting scholarship on this. There's 
but the genetic differences are tiny. But what happens is culture reinforces them. And uh, culture works over time, as Joshua Goldstein said. The thing I think we all need to remember whenever we hear a men do this and women do this is the overlapping bell curve. So if, for example, speed in marathons, men are faster than women. But in any given population, the fastest woman is taller than the slowest man. There's more overlap on most genetically determined characteristics than there is spread. So women differ more among themselves and men differ more among themselves than men as a group differ from women as a group. It's a, you know, a way of thinking about statistics that's really, really helpful as you begin to look at that. There aren't very many characteristics where men and women are discreetly different. Yes? I'd love to get your thoughts on Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin. Oh, it took me. Let's see. <laughs> really uh, the first question I got all last fall um, <laughs> when the book hit, the book hit. Yeah. Um, Boy, I thought a lot about this. Um, it's uh, Hillary Clinton is um, made history without question by being the first almost nominee of a major political party. The first really serious. She was not the first. Who was the first? I mean, you all know there were many women who have been nominated by the party. Who was the first? Does anybody know? I can't. You're all talking about what? Geraldine Barraro? Uh, nope. She was VP. VP was Geraldine. <laughs> Do you have an idea how long ago the first woman was ran for president? Well, there was a woman like 100 years ago who got like 14 votes or something at the convention, but I don't know her name. Is that like that? Well, that the first woman was nominated to actually that. run for president of the United States was Victoria Woodhull in 1872. Very, very interesting. She tried to get the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass to be her running mate, and they were running on the Equal Rights Party. She was a real character. She spent election night in jail for, for obscenity for accusing uh, a prominent minister of having an affair with his parishioner. And well, she did. <laughs> but she went to jail. She was a real character, a real hoot. But it's that long ago. And there have been lots of women who run for president. They've usually been favorite daughters like Margaret Choice Chase Smith of, of Maine or somebody like Shirley Chisholm in the 70s, 70s was the first African American woman to, to run for president. Usually these are candidates who've been um, making a point, <coughs> making an issue. So Hillary Clinton's unusual in that she was the first one to come close. Now Hillary Clinton is not unusual in another way. That is, if we look at women who've served in high political office in the United States, and I will use Congress as an example, 20% of them have succeeded their husbands. There's something about the spousal relationship that's been really, really powerful and continues to be, um, so, um, yeah, what's, uh, so. Congressman Saunders, her phrase it came in. Nikki Saunders and Paul. Paul, yeah. Okay, so we just had a recent one in Massachusetts. It's very, it's, that's been quite arm. common. Um, there, you know, it's the following the coffin. The interesting thing about Hillary, however, and I think it really affected tremendously her, her potential to win that nomination, is she, she was succeeding a husband who was still alive. <laughs> and that raises all the questions about spousal relationships, which enter into the workplace in fascinating ways. In our we haven't figured that out 
where their husbands and wives can be separate people. I think Hillary Clinton did amazing things to win a seat in the Senate after being First Lady and really was a pathfinder, and obviously she was a pathfinder in this election. Sarah Palin is, uh, I don't know how even how to talk about Sarah Palin, <laughs> except that she exemplifies another kind of um, tried and true method for success for women in the public eye, and that is she incorporates both traditional feminine and traditional masculine qualities. So she can shoot a moose, and she can be a mother of five children. And it's very interesting how that's played out in the representation of the case. Yeah, it's like, to that point, I would say she came in to politics through the way that many women in this country get True. involved in public service, which is through PTA. Yes. And things like that. And nice so I think, point. Like, Hillary Clinton had different privileges. She yes. Wellesley. Right, in a right, different world. Right, and so, and I think um, one of the really important points to, that we forget is that in the 19th century, before women could vote, women were powerful politically, and they were powerful politically through community organizations, like the anti-slavery movement, for example. You can't imagine the Civil War happening <laughs> without um, the engagement of women and uh, the temperance movement, uh, the you know, um, prohibition. Um, we have many things in our society, including public parks, kindergarten, because of these activist women. And one of the difficulties I think we have in our own society right now is that um, the restraints on female achievement have meant that areas that women, uh, no, the breaking of restraints on female achievement have meant that some of the things that women did really well because they have no other place to go are not getting done. And that's certainly true in the public school system where if you were a bright, ambitious woman, you taught school. Not college, you taught you know, the bright women in my childhood were the school teachers in the town. And, and now women look at you. <laughs> That's not what you're doing. And so each, each generation has to kind of reconfigure gender. And we've got a lot of work to do because we haven't sort of figured out how to value things, the ways in which women have made history as well as ways which man in the past made history. Anything else? We've got a couple of minutes. Yes? Uh, I noticed that at uh, first you talked about uh, women in the Middle Ages, uh, but when you talk about modern women, you talk about Americans. You don't say anything. You talk about Hillary Clinton, who almost became the nominee of maybe you say nothing about Benazir Bhutto and Indira Gandhi and people who did leave major well, that, that's because that was the question. <laughs> that was the question I got. It's interesting that uh, a friend um, told me that the, the day after Benazir Bhutto was um, assassinated, her son put up on his website, well-behaved women seldom make history, which was very, very interesting. But you make a really important point, and that is the United States is way lots of the world in terms of women in high political office. One of the things I always say to my students is, you know, we talk about a woman being president, but women have been ruling countries for centuries, probably from the beginning. I, mean, I, I talk in here about this very interesting archaeological work in the um, uh, Soviet steps where they're discovering these women, women warriors, women um, rulers in the large burial grounds called Kurgans. They're very, very interesting. They're able to identify them as women now because of DNA testing. They have weapons, and in the past, people always said they were men because they were buried with weapons. Now they were able to check. And in this particular society and community, 
women were often leaders in the particular clan um, that was buried in particular parts of this region of the world. And certainly there have been many queens and rulers who were women. But that's about class and, and it's about kinship. And when leadership is determined by kinship, I mean, we're back to the Hillary Clinton example, for example, that is women can. Um, if you want to maintain a certain class in power, a certain family in power, you just can't afford to worry about gender as much. So it's an, it's an interesting problem. It's an excellent point. One more? Um, about the, the clan thing, yeah. one, one more point. The, um, often I think what people see is here was someone who seemed reasonable and presumably has a reasonable debate about these issues at home and yeah. thinks reasonably about them. Someone else from the same home was an adult at the same time, we can expect a certain amount of overlap with. Mm -hmm. But if you ignore that, it says a lot that the wife of a deceased congressman often serves better, serves the country better than the people who actually ran on their own campaign to win the office mm -hmm. with nothing except the money hidden behind them, <laughs> pushing them into it, um, and and suggests maybe a, a random selection of, of uh, yeah, <laughs> congressional yeah, representatives. That's interesting. That's that's interesting. It's something that you know you could you could really look at. It's it's um, it's a fascinating issue. I mean, one thing that I haven't mentioned at all that. Uh, um, that's dear to my heart. I mean, it's the probably the chapters I most enjoyed writing about were the chapters about what ordinary people have done, particularly through the collective action, to make a difference. And, um, you know, I alluded to that in terms of the work on the Underground Railway, but one of the things that was so interesting to me is to see some of the scholarship that's been done on um, Hand, what we would think of as the, the domestic arts or handcraft. And I've been interested in the um, houses that women make for their families traditionally in Southern Africa, in, in Botswana and Zimbabwe and some other parts of Southern Africa that are literally, you know, made out of earth and animal dung. Um, and yet are so incredibly ornamented with using different color clays to create these sculptural forms that are just stunning. Now, the, the skills are declining. A lot of it's now done out of cinder blocks, and there are lots of reasons for that. But people who have taken the time and the trouble to document these skills and these crafts um, have, have told us something about how people put lives together in scarcity and with very few resources in ways that are spiritually uplifting and engaging, which doesn't mean that people who don't have resources are more spiritual than other people. It just means that human beings are quite amazing and, and have an inner desire to create beauty and meaning and we need to, I think, be conscious of those things in our scholarship and in, in our own lives and not think we kind of got it solved here um, because we have such technical sophistication. So there's a lot to do, a lot to learn. Curiosity and caring probably make more difference than anything else. Um, you make history by what you're doing, the kind of company you're in, the kind of lives that you live, the world that you live in. You make history when you document things, when you save them, when you care for them. But you make history also when you read other people's books, including mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay.